I'll share a song with you my cousin and I wrote about our grandma. It's called I Want to Be Known. I want to be known for the calluses on my knees. I want to be known rooted like a tree. I want to be known for being strong in time. I want to be known for the time I spend in prayer. I want to be known for reminding us you're always there. When people say my name, I want your name to follow soon. I want to be known for the way that I've known you. When people think of me, they think of you. And when they speak of me, they speak of you. When my days have seen their rich song will still carry through. Cause I want to be known for the way good I've known you. I want to be known for loving like you do I want to be known for your mercy and your truth When troubled times may come I've been a friend that follows through I want to be known for loving like you do when people think of me, they think of you. And when they speak of me, they speak of you. When my days have seen their inch, song will still carry through. Cause I want to be known all the way that I've known you. When my days have seen their end, your song will still carry through. Cause I want to be known for the way that I've known you. I want to be known for the way that I've known you. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. Today we're going to be talking about how wisdom requires action, and we see that through uh, the wise men in how they responded to the light. Now, eventually, hard knocks will wear the body out, so it's not the wisest way to be if you require um, in, in yourself to do things the hard way the first time. I think back in my own life and some of my friends, and they'd say to me, Casey, I just got to give it a try. Now, I was a daredevil myself. I've swung on the highest swings and done the highest of roller coasters and, and had a good time. So I'm not painting a perfect picture of Casey because I've broken 13 bones. I've, I've, I've done some things that I should not have done. But nevertheless, sometimes we just need to say the wisest thing to do is to do what's right no matter how you feel. So here in Matthew chapter 2, it contains the nativity scene. And we read that the wise men responded to the star in the sky. These wise men were wise because they recognized the light that was leading them to Christ. And they headed down their way. So point number one is that wise men study. And I'd like to make that point because they knew what the star represented. They had been in the study. They had read the literature. They were studying things um, like the lineage of Christ and the birthplace of Christ and the star in the sky. They, they knew the scripture. So by searching and studying, the wise men knew 
that they were being led to the king, to the Messiah, to the one who would die for all of humanity on their part. John also referred back to the scriptures and readings to his audience in his gospel. He says in John chapter 7, verse 42, Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So John, like the wise men, were faithful to study and they knew that literature or writings or the scriptures talked about these things. They wouldn't have known about these things unless they had studied these things or read these things or been told these stories. And so they knew about them and they were then therefore able to respond. And so wise men study and find out the truth. They study things like Psalms 89.3 that says, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. The psalmist portrayed that through the line of David, the king of kings and lord of lords would be born. It would be him who would establish the line, and Jesus would come in that line of Christ. So this psalm is a royal psalm, and the writer rehearses this covenant in poetic form so that others would be able to read it for generations to come. And think about it. We're responsible to study and to know for ourselves. Put yourself in the wise men's shoes and think, would you have been faithful to study? I hope you would have because that is how they got saved. And so today, we study to find out God's truths. And we study things like the Old Testament minor prophets. Micah 5.2 says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Mike is speaking to it, the place of Bethlehem. Too little to be among the clans of Judah. Judah's a large place. Bethlehem is the smallest town around. But yet, he says, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler of Israel. And so the prophecy that God speaks through the prophet, the minor prophet Micah, identifies this no-name town of Bethlehem out in the middle of the woods this town that hasn't done anything yet thus far will be the place that the king will be born. Not only that, the wise men knew of the book of Numbers in the book of the law. Numbers twenty four seventeen says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. And the scepter shall rise out of Israel, and it shall crush the forehead, forehead of Moab and break down the sons of Sheth. So the wise men, get it, they studied. They studied scripture and prophecy and poetry and the covenants of the Old Testament because this portion of scripture here in Numbers is a rather complicated prophecy to understand if you don't know the land, if you don't know what is actually Going on, and what was actually going on is that this star that was mentioned in Numbers 24 was prophesied by an unusual character named Balaam. And Balaam seems to have been traveling, and they knew him as a soothsayer, which is not the best occupation to have. But at the same time, he was in the right land in the, in the river of Euphrates, Numbers talks about, around Babylon, and Balaam was contracted by Balak to curse the Israelites. And get this, Balak was the king of Moab, and at that time the Israelites were moving through Moab's territory, and this was part of their journey to get to the promised land. And instead of showing hospitality, they tried to curse the Israelites. The Israelites weren't embraced, they were rejected, but at the same time God supersedes evil and brings good out of the evil plans of the Moabites and the Moabite king. And the prophecy that landed, even in the midst of all of that weirdness, portrays Christ to come. So here it is. He stands up to prophesy uh, as the contract said to, to curse Israel. And guess what came out of his mouth? Not a curse, but a blessing in a prophecy that uh, Jesus would be the one to come. So the Moabite king, Balak, contracted this magician named Balaam to curse Israel 
And here's what he said. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. And so that was recorded. And let me share with you this. Since he was bought or paid to prophesy or to condemn the Israelites, but something else came out of his mouth, that makes it obvious that that was the Lord working through him. And so that would catch your attention as one who would be reading the book of Numbers. You know the land, you know the people, and you couldn't help but try and figure out, well, what is this talking about? A star shall come out of Jacob. Now, by application, I would say, by you wholeheartedly searching for Christ, you will find him. I can say that confidently to everybody in the entire world. If you search for Christ wholeheartedly, you will find him. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Do you think the wise men searched for Christ with um, half-heartedness or wholeheartedness? Do you think that the wise men searched for Christ in such a way that they were holding back or they were all in? You know, to make a journey like they made, they were all in. To, to study like they studied, they were all in. So if you would be wise, then today I would say make a habit of studying God's word. Make it a habit to search the scriptures daily. Make it a habit to dive deep into that. And, and, and by the way, there's no better book, I think, than going to Starbucks by Paul Copan. Get it, it's cheap right now. It's a great book, and in that book, he conquers some of the barriers from which atheists or non-believers would say, God doesn't exist, or he's not a moral God, or how could God do that? He takes all the hard subjects and combs through that chapter by chapter, and uh, I recommend having a dictionary beside of the book while you read. It's that good. No, point number two is that wise men start. Not only do wise men and women study the scriptures, but they start. They're initiators. Verse 2 says that the wise men saw the star, and they started on their journey. They came. They saw the star, and they came. And so you can't just know the right thing to do and not do it. That's not wise. The wise thing to do is to actually get started. And often I just you know sympathize with everybody at this point. Often getting started is the hardest thing in the world. Getting started in the mornings is the hardest thing in the world sometimes. Getting started doing the right thing that you know you should be doing is just something that we put on the back burner and the back shelf. And we know we ought to be doing that. But it's just hard to get started. And then, sure as a world, as soon as you muster up the strength to get started doing the right things that we know God is urging us to do, Satan will send a skeptic. Sure as a word, as soon as you get on the right path, someone's casting doubt on the very things that you're doing that you know are right. For example, David Hume declared that those who believe in miracles are ignorant and barbarous. It's like, what? And then he goes on to say, they apparently are not sophisticated, clear thinking, nor scrutinizing. And I think to myself, sure as a world, Satan will send, you know, somebody like this that's an atheist and that thinks they're studied, but they're on the wrong path to derail someone who is just now coming to Christ. Well, I'm going to tell you that that Scottish philosopher, historian, and economist David Hume was wrong. Don't you agree? He was born in the 1700s, and he was a, a, an influencer a lot of people listened and read his writings, but he's wrong, 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 and unbiblical, and biblical, and biblical. He should have listened to Matthew's writings here, um, what the wise men did, and followed Jesus in the star to Bethlehem. So the wise men followed the star, and they found Jesus. They studied and knew about the star, and they started on their journey, and they found Christ. David Hume would not have followed the star, he would have stayed at home and missed Jesus. God provides plenty of light for people to come to Christ. All around the nation, all around the world, don't care how far away they are from civilization, there's enough light for them to follow and to find Christ. Now, the path isn't easy. Sometimes it'll be difficult. Think of the wise men. There had to be some 
one of those guys staying up late at night studying, and he saw the star. And he thought to himself, I've never seen that star before. That star's a different color than the rest of the stars. That star's a little bit brighter than the rest of the stars. And so through studying astrology, he thought to himself, that's different. But maybe he couldn't figure it out on his own. He thought, uh, I'll ask another wise man. And he brought in another guy into the place, and he said, that star's a different star, isn't it? Am I going crazy, or is that a different star? And he might say, you know what? That star is facing the west. We're in the east. It is probably over Bethlehem. I've read about a star pointing towards Bethlehem for the Messiah. He went, oh, wow, that's pretty neat. And then all of a sudden, they would kind of put two and two together, and they would combine their information and knowledge, and then they would move from what they've studied to starting down on their journey and head in that direction and be wise. Wise men start godly things. James 1.22 says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word. You can hear all day long. Even the demons believe that God is real. But until you put action to your faith, does it mature and start you in the right direction? James 2.20 2 says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is not alive. It, it's dead. And so wise men start heading in the right direction. If you would be a wise person, start doing what you know you should do. That would make you a wise individual. And when God opens the door for you to participate in his kingdom process and be a disciple maker or on commission with the Great Commission and discipling others or teaching a class or studying his word or serving the lost and meeting needs or whatever the case might be, whatever it is, whatever door God opens for you, you would be a wise person to start and not delay. Don't delay in what you know you should do, but at that point, the person is in front of you and the opportunity to serve is, is right at that point. So I would say, let's do it. I think that's the right thing to do. Number three, wise men are spiritual. They're discerning and they are deliberate. The wise men were spiritual enough on their journey when they were face to face with the evil King Herod to not listen to him, though there was a lot of pressure to do so. There's a lot of pressure to do what's wrong in this world, but they were spiritual and discerning enough to know what was right, and they did it. Not only were they discerning, but they were deliberate even in the gifts that they gave Jesus. The gold, frankincense, and myrrh were representative of a king. So think, a gold is symbolic for Christ's deity, and that's fit for a king. Frankincense represented the incense, which was kind of like what the priest used to lift up their prayers to God. And then the myrrh was symbolic of his death. They used it for embalming. So even in the gifts, the wise men were wise and laying down exactly what they believed to be. Point number four, the wise men stay close to God. Notice on their journey, as they were face to face with Herod, in this story, God warned them not to go back to Herod, but to go home. And so the wise men stayed close to God, and they avoided, in my opinion, being beheaded. Because Herod would have found them out at that time and lured them back in and beheaded them. So as Jason comes up to play a time of response, I want you to decide if you've been obedient and wise, if, if, if it's time to maybe... Start in a direction, make 2018 a time where you commit to the Lord. And I'd ask you, is God dealing with you inwardly in any area? Then commit right now to do what you know is right to do. Is God leading you to make a decision for Christ and be saved? Well, today could be the day of your salvation. Today could be the day to where you, you say, Lord, I submit to you and I believe that you sent your son to die in our place. I believe that he died on the cross and rose again for my sins. Please save me. At the moment you place your faith in that, you're saved. At the moment you decide to, to trust in Christ, you're saved. And then from there, I'd encourage you to join a good Bible-believing and Christ-honoring, worshiping church, like Beulah, like you're at right now. 
join, be a part. There's, there's so many benefits to being a close part of a local church. There's fellowship, there's worship, there's prayer, there's support and accountability, and there's love, and there's, there's really a whole new family, a wonderful family. In my opinion, everybody should be a member of a local church where they can be encouraged and loved on, and then I also can love others. So I'd ask if you would stand to your feet, please. And if there's anybody who wants to make a decision for Christ, oh, it's a memorable time of the year to do that. Jason, i got to share a testimony with you. You know, we spent three Sundays on one verse. Jude chapter 1 verse 23 says to save others by snatching them out of the fire. And, um, and, and at the conclusion of one of those services, I said the same as I said today. If there's anybody here who wants to be saved, just repeat after me. You can place your faith in Christ. And, uh, and at that time, we didn't know it, but Tristan was in the back praying that prayer, and he has asked Jesus to be his Savior. You give him a round of applause, amen. Oh, and today he comes and is requesting to be a member of Eula Baptist Church, and if you would like Tristan to be a part of our family, say amen. 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 And we've talked about this already, and we've even said, you know what, if the first step to being discipled is is baptism to publicly portray that you're putting the old life away and coming back up in newness of Christ so we're going to pull out the baptistry in the second week in January Tristan's going to bring his family a matter of fact I think it's his aunt and his grandmother here today give them a round of applause thank you for coming <laughs> and I have for Tristan a book here I'm going to give to him on how to be a, a church member so here you go take a chapter you know a month and kind of read on that and guys we're going to have a good service in the second week in january so invite your friends we'll have the baptistry out and i kind of side with lynn in that with this new year we might as well just keep that baptistry out and reach people for christ and then lead them to the lord and see them get baptized and then continue and enjoy this wonderful place so Thank you for coming. Go ahead and be seated if you would, please. Where Jason's going to sing one final song, and we're going to take up an offering for him. So deacons, if you would, go ahead and bring the offering up, and I'm going to pray for Tristan and ask a, a wonderful blessing upon Jason for a favor in coming. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for Tristan. Thank you for his commitment. Thank you for uh, the authenticity. I see the genuineness in his eyes. I, I, I feel the reverberations of his heart and how it is true. He, he is so sincere. What a privilege it, it's been to just talk with him. And, and I pray that our men would wrap their loving arms around Tristan at this new part of his life and to continue to encourage him. And I pray that Tristan would commit to um, the Christian walk in life and be able to um, withstand the, the temptations of the evil one and he'd commit to serving your local church. And I pray you pour out your blessings upon him tremendously. Not only that, Lord, I pray that we'd be a loving congregation today and, and, um, and give whatever's on our heart to Jason. 
for coming and, and his lovely wife. We thank you so much for your blessings. In Christ's name, amen.